This talk is about a guided tour to European IT lobbying. Um, I, as some other people in this room, are active in FFII, in the European IT lobbying. We did the software patents debate and uh, were recently also involved in the data retention um, vote, which was um, apparently lost. And um, my aim of this talk is to not to focus on a, issue, on a specific issue, but on a general level um, explain on how to interact with the European Parliament or, in, or European bodies in order to promote your own case. And um, I, I wanted to focus on where to, re, where to find documents, how to retrieve documents and things like that. But uh, looking at uh, some contributions at this conference, um, and, uh, well, uh, coming here by train, I, I made some, some notes, so I, I shifted a little bit the focus of my, my talk. I have also a, a German paper in the proceedings uh, to this conference. This is this uh, big proceedings paper collection uh, you can obtain at the info desk. A guided tour to European IT lobbying. This means um, I'll, I'll take you step by step through um, what I think personally is, is relevant here. So um, it will basically mean a short introduction. This is what I'm currently doing. Uh, Ten Commandments, uh, this is what I came up with yesterday when I collected uh, some, some basic uh, core issues which I think are relevant. Uh, then provide an overview about databases. Um, if the web connection works, um, um, give you an idea on how to contribute to consultations and provide other useful input to the European Parliament, which bodies are relevant uh, for promoting your case. And perhaps, I, I don't know uh, whether the time, well, the time will be left over, um, I will focus a little bit on, on the lobbying environment, what other groups are active in, in Brussels, um, often depicted as um, yeah, the lobbyists, the traditional lobbyists, and um, which are usually referred as the bad guys, those uh, who want to promote monopolies and, and things like that. But um, um, I think they are just uh, other stakeholders, and often they are not very efficient, as we learned from from our debate. Now, um, well, <laughs> I made this uh, presentation during uh, the train ride. Um, now. Um, the case is very simple. There's something like a, like a stone on a hill, and then you have this city here, this, uh, this Congress city, and uh, there's this arrow, and some, something pushes against the stone. Perhaps it could be a bird or, or whatever. Um, and then evil things happen because the stone moves downhill, and you can blame gravity for it. And well, um, the problem then is that probably this will create some, some damage. And uh, this is what we, this is a view we, we share among very different um, um, IT policy issues. Uh, they are somehow started, uh, then they enter parliament, enter um, the different European bodies, the council, um, the commission has it say, it's a complicated uh, process and in the end, there will be some regulation, and this regulation, probably bad regulation, will create damage in, in your community or in other communities. And um, so the question is how to avoid this damage. And when you are a kind of superhero, uh, <laughs> I, excuse myself, um, I'm not that familiar with open office and uh, its it capabilities to, to make uh, nice pictures during a train ride are a little bit limited. Um, but uh, you can interact, do lobbying at different stages. And uh, what I wanted to show with the different size uh, broadness of these arrows is um, that you need very little, little power at an early stage of development. But when, 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 the, when it runs downhill, so you need more superpower. It's always a question of time and strength. On the one hand, 
when you are in a debate like the software patents debate, which was started, I think, in 2002, so we had a, and ended in 2005, uh, so we had a, a long, a really long debate and a long time and was delayed and, and so on. Uh, so we had time to organize a movement, to, to organize ourselves and so on, to, to, to create awareness in the community, to discuss it for a very long time with Parliament. And we um, stopped um, this um, directive at the almost the very last step uh, before it crushed into this uh, little city. But what I want, and which is a personal concern of me, is um, that you have to, when you deal with these issues, stop them in an early stage of development. Because what you don't do in an early stage of development, um, you have to gain more strength in, an, in the later uh, stage of development, which is sometimes difficult, and in the data retention uh, debate, um, well, uh, the movement was just not strong enough in the end. And, um, we, couldn't, we did our best, we tried to stop it with all our superpowers, but um, we were not successful. And we don't blame it on ourselves. Um, it was just um, a complicated and tricky, tricky issue. So <laughs> this is uh, the basic presentation for fun here. Um, perhaps i back to the, to the second slide. Um, I came up with ten commandments, and they fit actually on on, on one, one page, and I think they are very, very important. Uh, when you are in a, in a lobbying environment, there are always differences. A uh, difference between interests on the one hand and information on the other hand. Um, often the assumption is um, if those decision makers knew what this is all about, if they knew what this directive actually means, um, then they would decide differently. And of course, there's also, and this has somehow to be separated, uh, a difference in interests. Uh, usually, a parliament is a very fair representation of, of interests and interest groups. Um, they are elected, um, and I know voting is, is not perfect, um, but I wouldn't really blame it on, on the voting on the voting procedures. Of course, you can think of a, of a, perfect, of a perfect parliament, which would be a, like a, a, kind of, a kind of random parliament, which means, uh, well, um, just randomly uh, citizens are selected as MEPs. Then it would be a perfect representation of people, statistically uh, representation of people, because, uh, well, um, um, I, I get a letter and uh, you were selected as an MEP because of this uh, kind, of, kind of lotto game. Um, so, um, but um, we don't have this uh, random selection of representatives of MEPs. So we have voting rules. Um, special people are voted and generally the assumption is that, and my experience of the debate is uh, that Parliament is a very, very good body and that our voting system somehow works. And if there is a problem in democracy, in, in the system, then it's not because of Parliament, but uh, this problem originates from the, the whole institutional framework, um, of the lack of checks and balances within the system. Um, on the European level, usually citizens think um, the European Parliament is really in charge of these legal proposals. But in fact, um, there's a procedure called co-decision. And um, this has to be taken uh, like this, co-decision. This is the role of Parliament on the European level. Uh, Der Spiegel, a German news magazine, called the European democracy a minor democracy. And my personal belief is that it's true. Um, the European framework is indeed a minor democracy because Parliament is not really in charge. And the Commission, a very important body with uh, 26 uh, uh, general directorates and um, 26 commissioners, is not elected by Parliament. And they come up with all these proposals. They are appointed by the governments, these uh, 26 commissioners, by the national governments. And then we have the European Council, who also shares 
legislative powers with the European Parliament, and the, which is a second body, and it works similar to Bundesrat in, in, in Germany, in a, f a kind of federal system, which actually means that this, um, that this council, um, usually in this council of ministers, um, there are people not, not really, the states are represented, and the states often means the ministers. The ministers on this specific topic are represented in, in the European Council, uh, like the ministers of interior, or even on a lower level, their staff workers, um, uh, <laughs> their, their staff people, like uh, people from the ministries, from the Ministry of Justice, for instance, in Germany, um, uh, the, the Department of Justice in Germany, actually. So. Um, Bundestag or um, national, national parliaments often have uh, hardly any influence on what is decided in the European Council because um, the Council of Ministers, because the Council of Ministers is very intransparent. And there's an institutional struggle on the European level and um, these institutions are a little bit unbalanced. Um, unbalanced in the sense that European Parliament is very weak so our problem, we always said uh, power to the parliament, uh, which actually meant, meant um, that uh, parliament is the body that has to be strengthened. And uh, Eurosceptics usually tend to, li like the UK Independence Party, um, they usually try to strengthen the national state because they think um, on the European level, uh, when their, their national government represents them on the European level, um, uh, it gives, uh, gives citizens more say, but, but the fact is uh, that governments are not really good controlled by national parliaments. This is a problem we especially faced in the soft patents debate. Um, yeah, um, lobbying, what is lobbying about? Um, some people say information supply, like advertisement, is officially also for information supply. Now. Um, I think it's information, information supply on the one hand, uh, assisting parliament to do its job and uh, to raise a stakeholder interest, to demonstrate I represent, say, security professionals and security professionals want this or that. And we are the specialists. We know more about it than a general MEP and we provide you with this useful stuff. Um, <laughs> the Ten Commandments of successful lobbying. Uh, this is just a list of, of 10 points um, that I think are very important and that you really have to bear in mind when you do lobbying on the European level. The first I already mentioned is start early. Start, um, start early in the whole process, in the whole legislative process. Uh, get into it on, on an early stage of development and well, you, you shall be a kind of a first mover. Um, it's better when you are the first person, uh, the first group who knows about all this, what's going on. And if you report about the issues, if you make the news and discuss it and discuss it with the community and contribute to consultations, and usually um, then time is on your side. You have uh, a, a preparation, more preparation to prepare your positions and, and so on and to gain trust inside Parliament. Uh, the second important issue, um, from my perspective, so uh, the second commandment is um, you should get organized and especially organized also on a regional level uh, in member states. There are organizations like FFI, like IDRI, which are organized, but there are many um, in, whole, in whole Europe, but um, there are some organizations or some interests which are not even organized. For instance, there's no European Association of Security Professionals, as far as I know. And when you look at um, the outcome of the legislative process, you clearly, say, uh, you clearly see um, that um, there were no security professionals involved. So it's very important to organize interests um, be it uh, security professionals, be it uh, interoperability, which is a, an important topic. 
Um, and um, it's also important that you are present in Brussels. So this, this is expensive. It's expensive to have a permanent lobbyist in, in Brussels. Um, but before a vote, it's useful to have about 10 people minimum in, in Brussels, which just say stay in a hotel and uh, go up and down parliament and provide voting lists to the MEPs, discuss with them, and, and so on. So um, parliament is generally very open. Uh, the third <laughs> commandment, um, um, another talk today in this room uh, stressed the same, uh, same issue, is um, that I recommend you to be honest when you, when you advocate. Um, that means uh, that you shall stick to the truth or what you regard as an approximation of, of your current knowledge of the truth because it makes advocacy of, of yourself much easier. It's, it's kind of a psychological issue. When you're convinced about, and when you know I, I tell what, what I know, really know about what I'm convinced about, then you can outperform um, almost any lobbyist who just uh, promotes a case which is not his own. Um, someone told me uh, one campaigner is worth uh, 10 traditional lobbyists. And this is certainly true. Perhaps the number has to be corrected um, even on an on a upper level. Um, and and the, the real um, issue is to become a reliable source to these MEPs, provide useful information to them, and a, a trust, create a kind of trustworthy relationship. Um, generally, MEPs know you, know you better. Because, um, so you cannot really uh, masquerade because there are so many lobbyists which approach them every day, every time. So you get a certain sense as an MEP, you get a certain sense for people. And you easily get whether someone is, is acting or if someone really defends his own case. And um, um, so, so it's not really really good to play uh, tactical games or like that. Usually you gain not much about it. Uh, the fourth issue, uh, which I believe is important, is, uh, well, as a kind of suggestion, you don't have to take it literally, but um, it would be a, a good advice to try to convince your grandma. Because your grandma is probably a person which has uh, good will to you, tries to understand you, but probably has not the real capacity uh, to understand why it's important to you. Um, so um, MEPs are similar. They are often not experts in, in the issue. Um, they, they often have, have good will. It depends on, on their ideology. But um, in generally, you can assume that they are um, not, not really against you on an ideological level. So um, in order to train to promote your case, it's, uh, it's probably the best to try to convince people who are not in the business, who are not in the community, um, as, as a test case. And well, the fifth commandment is um, to investigate your environment and um, build a knowledge base about what other groups are doing. Um, investigate the whole issue, investigate um, who's in charge of, um, of, the, of the whole stuff um, you're concerned about. Um, and this knowledge base, um, we found uh, that a, a wiki system is very suited for it. When you have a community and you collect uh, facts, you collect um, notes about um, um, who's, who's part of that community or um, who interacts with whom and where to get uh, uh, the source. So um, a, a wiki system is, is very useful. It's very useful to compile information and uh, just to collect it. This uh, Zettelkasten method, uh, so to speak. Um, when interacting, and um, this is more about how to present yourself. Um, a kind of contradiction is, is, the, eight, is the sixth commandment. This is um, don't be anti. Don't be the protest movement. Because um, the problem is always that when you are the anti-movement, then you defend a kind of conservative case. 
in some areas it has to be done like this. Like uh, software patents, you have to say, oh, no software patents. Um, but really, um, this, this anti-attitude is not really very much convincing because, well, um, MEPs or decision makers, they want to change things. They, they don't want to stay like it is. And um, if you're just defending, you cannot really, really gain much. You can just uh, destroy the project, uh, so to speak. But interestingly, um, you can always turn this around. You can always say, um, well, uh, we are not against software patents, but we defend the freedom of software development or, or things like that. Uh, it does not work, work always. Or we defend human rights or we defend uh, um, privacy or, or things like that. You can also always turn this around and create a positive message. And uh, this is often more convincing. Uh, you also have to be concerned that in the media, usually there's a standard scheme which um, somehow gives you an impression how you are regarded in the public and journalists are usually not really biased. Um, this is usually um, the, the strong party, the first party is, is mentioned and then there is, uh, then for the first party says we need data retention and then for, for balancing a journalist adds uh, the anti-group and says but uh, privacy activists say no we don't need data retention and it's dangerous. Um, and uh, a kind of indicator uh, of where you stand is whether, you are the per where, whether your interests are the group which is mentioned first or whether your interest is mentioned second. Um, this is somehow related to the, to the seventh commandment and um, this is um, beware of the big guy trap. Um, big guy, small guy trap. Uh, big guy, small guy is a, is, a, is a kind of scheme which is very good to, to gather supporters and it's, it's quite dangerous. Um, when you look at uh, some contributions at this conference here, some papers and so on, you often find this big guy, small guy scheme. Um, there are the evil conspirators, the, the monopolists, whatever they want data retention, whatever. And then you have the small guys uh, which are ignored and therefore uh, democracy is, uh, is broken and, and think like, things like that. Um, the problem is um, that politicians, while they have sympathy with the small guy, and this is what this scheme somehow plays with, um, it's, it's in, in every system, in every community, um, it's uh, the dominant strategy to side with the big guy, with the um, more important party. Um, because um, in, a, in every system, um, the more important party somehow has to rule. Um, and, uh, so, um, and the other group is, is the minority opinion. So th when there's no reason to depict your own interests as the minority opinion, then simply don't do it. Um, yeah, um, this also applies to the seventh commandment, which um, I, I comprehend is um, don't rationalize. That is, uh, don't say things which you cannot know, because uh, you really don't know it, you just suppose it. You try to rationalize why your opponent wants this, or why the EU starts a, a legislative project. Uh, it's, it's like saying um, um, Bush went to Iraq because of oil interests. Um, actually, I, I personally don't know whether it was about oil interests. And, and by, by doing so, you rationalize, as a, as a mirroring, uh, you rationalize what your opponent, your opponent does. Um, and often this is um, associated with a kind of premise. The premise um, in this, in this uh, Iraq example is um, that it's immoral to um, invade a country just because of oil interests. But uh, this premise does not have to be shared uh, among, among every citizen. And um, so you have to be very cautious about this. Or like um, uh, in the software patents debate, many people said, well, Microsoft wants software patents because they want to kill free software. 
um, well, of course, there was uh, one, one of this Halloween papers um, which indicated this as an option to destroy free software, but we don't really know whether this is the driving force or the agenda behind. And sometimes I feel that these lobbyists uh, somehow parrot um, what, what the other side uh, uh, thinks about it. Uh, the, the ninth com commandment is, um, well, um, keep, keep your action under control, uh, or, or better, know what you do. Um, it's often said in, in lobbying guides, uh, well, uh, don't insult MEPs, be, be kind to them, be friendly, and, and so on, and dress, dress nice uh, to the common business standards, and, and so on. But um, I would rather say it's important that you, for instance, when you insult someone, you don't insult him accidentally or because of an emotion, but because you want it so. Um, because this is your aim to insult him in order to create a certain effect. So um, try to um, think about what you are currently doing and whether this is efficient or effective and what effects it will have. And not generally be friendly or things uh, like that. And in many cases it's very useful not to be friendly but to to hit someone or to push someone in a certain direction. Uh, in, in the, before the first, um, first reading of the Software Patents Directive, um, Ali McCarthy was, was heavily targeted by FFI. And many people inside FFI thought um, this was a little bit inappropriate. But, but the fact was that the vote was obviously won because uh, many, many people inside Parliament were upset about uh, this particular person, uh, Arlene McCarthy. So this um, unusual style was, in fact, the appropriate style. And, uh, well, the tense rule, the tense commandment is um, uh, forget lobbying guides. I mean, uh, develop your own style. Do, what's, uh, do what you think is, is good, and um, usually um, what, what we found out was that SME representatives, they somehow magically usually know what to do. Uh, they talk to MEPs and they don't obey really to, to guides or th like that. Um, they are used to, to discuss with customers, and so they can also discuss with, uh, with other players or other people and MEPs, and they just they just are themselves and present themselves and present their interests, and they're very good in that. Uh, so you don't need lobbying guides, uh, how to behave, and, and things like that. Um, what I would encourage you is, um, and I think this is important, uh, don't spam MEPs, because MEPs don't like that. Uh, we had the problem with this, um, um, I think it was from, from Compact, Compact this, this tool, which sent uh, automatically generated messages to MEPs in, in one copyright debate. There was a problem with the kind of spam tool of uh, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, uh, which spammed uh, these, these MEPs, and this was quite unsuccessful. So um, I suggest you don't pollute Parliament, because um, those people acting in Parliament and defending this case um, get serious trouble when all these MEPs and their co-workers are annoyed because they are spammed with these, uh, with these always the same messages or um, um, get uh, 200 messages a day. Um, it could be a useful issue um, when you, useful instrument when you don't have access to Parliament. But when you have access uh, to Parliament, this is quite damaging. So um, this, is, uh, <laughs> this was the, the, the preface. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a little question. I've, I've waited that you finish this ten commands. Um, but I don't know it now. 
Yeah. I, I thought I can wait to it, but yeah, it doesn't help. I don't have a clear picture of the working of a lobbyist. Uh, I have in mind, maybe I've watched too much television, uh, that a lobbyist is doing, I don't know, uh, owner of an oil, oil company is going to a regional politician and give him a, 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 a cover with, with money in it and, and t tell him, please give us the, please change the law to give us the right to make a drill station in a natural reservoir or some kind of this. So my question is, um, how do you get the connection to this parliament to us? And um, how does the works look like? Are you meeting them in, in a kind of cafe or are you going at home to them? Are you t make phone calls to them? Are you just emailing? How do you get the access to them, the physical access? How does it look like? A day in Brussels of your work. And the second one is, uh, what is the interest of a parliamentarian uh, to make the connection to a lobbyist like you? Well, uh, in parliament, um, they are used to talk to, to stakeholders in general because they don't know really about these issues. And so they want, usually want to get input from, uh, from specialists and uh, well, this is the, like the way it works. Um, paying MEPs to vote for, for a certain thing, well, this is corruption and usually um, it, it, of course, it depends on the state. Um, I know that it, there are states w where this is quite common, but in the European Parliament, it does not work in that direct way. Um, it's, it's not really that they pay them, but um, somehow um, they are the guys with, with the, which they hang around somehow. Um, access to Parliament for citizens is it's very easy because um, they have an office, you can talk to them, they invite you to conferences sometimes, um, or you have relations to, to certain groups in Parliament. You always find in almost any group someone who is who's on your side, and then you try to uh, convince inside Parliament and um, um, get, get these votes together, or you have relations. Of course, it, it needs, uh, you have to be present in, in Brussels. And uh, we have a lobbyist in Brussels, uh, Eric Josefsson, and he was there for, for I think, two years. Uh, so um, um, it's all about to, to creating this kind of uh, trustful relationship. Uh, for, for you as a conference here, perhaps a relationship could start like um, you invite an MEP to this meeting here and he talks about it. Actually, I invited uh, a, a co-worker from the European Parliament, but uh, she couldn't come. Um, so, um, and of course, when you are in the, in the debate, then there are other groups uh, which have access to certain politicians and talk to them. So um, perhaps uh, we have access to someone and so we forward something from another group. Or, when you are uh, an important stakeholder in a debate, you somehow just get uh, consulted uh, because you wrote, wrote letter to them or you talk to them or um, anything else. So contacting Parliament is not really a problem. Uh, getting um, access to the Council or the Commission is, is more difficult and, and takes more money. Um, yeah. Um, what, I, what I collected here are some, some links to uh, document repositories um, I cannot go in, into it on all the details. Um, Can you read well, please? Oh, oh no, oh no. Um, uh, this, this page here is wiki.ffi.org22c3en. Uh, um, so I, there I collected all these links. Uh, these are different document repositories. Uh, the European Union produces a lot of documents in the legislative process, a lot of documents. Um, and actually, the, uh, the European Parliament, uh, the Commission, the Council, they all have their own document repositories. And they're not only documents from, the, from Parliament or from the Commission, but also uh, preparatory documents, um, questions from parliamentarians to the Commission, and so on. Um, what's important then? is that you know how to, how to find these documents. Because you cannot just say, I want 
software patents, but this directive is called a uh, directive on the patentability of computer implemented inventions. And uh, or this IPR enforcement directive second uh, is, is named, COM, also the original commission proposal is named COM 2005 uh, 276 final. So uh, this, is an, this is a number you have to keep in mind. And then you usually find these documents very easily. Um, well, uh, this, these, these re registers improved a lot. Um, the main disadvantage of these registers is that you cannot search them just via Google, uh, full text search. Um, these files are hidden. So once you find a uh, certain file, uh, download them, save them locally, or save them on an the FTP server, because uh, it could well, well be that you don't find them back, these documents. And there are a lot of documents uh, available, talks, um, uh, preparatory documents. Um, uh, a directive does not just pop up. A directive uh, is prepared with uh, green papers and uh, communications and speeches and so on. And all these are signals that something is going on. Um, I, I, I'm a little bit limited in time here. But when you look here, for instance, for data retention, so this is data retention. Then you will find some, some interesting documents, plenary document, or probably plenary speech, or no, oh, amendments. Amendments are change proposals. And this is from the parliament, uh, the opinion from the committee. Uh, translated in, in various languages. This is quite interesting because um, every official document gets uh, translated into all official languages. Um, amendments, uh, yeah, no, so this, this, is our, this is the parliament da database, but here we have also a question time, a question from an MEP to Rev Source uh, author Claude Moraes. Address a cons, cons is council, data retention. Oh, this Word document, uh, I, I will not open it. Uh, but you see here the document date and, and so on. Um, interesting um, additional information um, you can gather from, from these documents. E.g., uh, for instance, um, that uh, an MEP asked the commission and what he asked the commission. And then you can look for, for the answer of, of the commission or of the council. And, uh, when, when you know that the parliamentarian uh, asked the question to the, um, to the council, then you know probably a little bit more about his attitude or um, that he was concerned about uh, the issue. And there are oral questions, official questions. So all these documents are quite interesting from my uh, point of view. And there are also, and you can, all re you can request almost any document from the European Union. Uh, this is interesting because what we are talking about, information freedom, um, on the EU level, uh, they have uh, de facto Swedish standards. Uh, you, can, you can get even documents which are sent from a lobby group to the president of the European Parliament. And they ju he just entered the document, scanned it, dec entered it into his uh, document database. So um, you can request this document. If it's not online, then you file a request, say, I want this document, please uh, send it to me, and then you will get perhaps a letter from the, from the commission of, of this institution, uh, or no, you, you cannot get this document because it's classified, or, or you get the document, and usually you get it um, if it's not online. You can search. Um, usually these search engines are somehow a little bit complicated, and. I personally prefer it uh, to have them downloaded uh, on an FTP server or anywhere else, uh, so you just can uh, play plain Google, Google or desktop search, um, because I always remember what's, what's part in the document, but not uh, what's the real name of it. There are other um, systems, a document re register of the European Union, which you can search, or Prelex. Prelex is an inf important service uh, to follow a legislative proposal. Um, I will give an example. I said COM 2005-276. Uh, 
search, and um, here you have it, a proposal for European Parliament and Council Directive on criminal measures aimed at ensuring the enforcement of intellectual property rights. This is the proposal for, the, for this IPR Enforcement Directive. And uh, the other document of our framework decision, um, this was because of this IPR Enforcement Directive, the second, it was split into two components, but all this, uh, what's described here is history because um, um, it was invalidated by the European Court of Justice and we um, expect it to pop up again in January. Now, um, and then it's explained here, um, and we have this document, and you see here there are also other documents, preparatory documents, uh, perhaps studies and, and things like that, proposed by the European Commission uh, accompanied to this uh, process. Um, very important is who is in charge of it inside Parliament. Uh, usually um, a directive, when it enters Parliament, it has a rapporteur in a committee. Rapporteur means um, the person in charge in the committee who prepares the report. Um, and there are also often shadow rapporteurs in the different political groups uh, in, inside Parliament, which is quite interesting. And you see here, oh, it's uh, transmitted to the Council 12-7, and um, well, nothing happened since then. And um, So this directive is a bad example because it's stalled and it's just at the beginning of, of the whole process. But you can find out, for instance, uh, who's, who's in charge of it um, in, inside Parliament, and this is the person which is probably most relevant in, in which, uh, and which committees of Parliament it will get debated before it's voted in plenary. And usually these, um, these groups, these committees, prepare change proposals called amendments to this directive or um, say, oh, this has to be changed, that has to be changed, and often plenary votes as um, the group proposed. Now, with the data retention uh, directive, we had it um, quite, quite the other way around, because um, that the committee had an opinion, but a um, very strange uh, process. The leaders of the biggest group said, okay, um, um, we make a deal with the council and uh, push it through with our majority um, against uh, what, what was decided and negotiated in the committee, and which was in charge. So this was quite unusual, but usually um, these committees are, are very important and the rapporteurs. So you don't have to talk to any MEP, and if you talk to an MEP who is not in charge, then he will say, oh yes, I have this rapporteur in my political group, or I trust him, and he, he does the opinion to my, of my party, and uh, in, in the plenary I will vote with him, because I trust this person, or, or things like that. Or perhaps uh, also don't... In, in European Parliament there are often very informal um, relationships uh, you only get aware of uh, when you're long time there. And then there's, of course, also a um, repository of the Council, which is, from my perspective, the best repository. Um, all these uh, URLs of these uh, uh, yeah, um, search engines are a little bit chaotic. You can also edit them, and there are some tricks. You change numbers, and, and um, I will not talk about that. Um, and then there's OILEX, um, which is a service um, in which um, law is presented, um, ratified law, law which, uh, which went through um, this process. Um, this, the next page um, I mentioned here, EU SIM DEMUST EN was, was done by us, or I think by Mirnik, um, who tried to explain what different shortcuts in a document uh, mean. And, um, well, what, what we did, for instance, um, oh, what's that? Hmm? Hmm. Okay. Okay, um, and there are also other documents. Um, this is a, a staff directory of, of the European Commission. It's also quite useful. When you meet someone at a conference, he's from the Commission, then you can just look up his name in, this, in the staff directory, and then you know um, where he works, 
what his position is, uh, whether he's somehow somebody just for, for the press or if he's really in charge and what, what his role is. Um, this is quite unusual that this um, organizational data is, is that open in the European Parliament because you can find out so, so much. Um, you, Sometimes in other governments, uh, this is really classified data, who's, who's in charge and who, who does, takes which job, this uh, organizational chart. Um, rules of procedure, the treaties, and, and so on, are very important in the legislative process. Uh, to know under which procedure uh, a legislative act is um, introduced into Parliament. Um, this is very complicated, but it's worth to investigate it, whether it's uh, applied under Article 95 and so on, because these procedural questions uh, decide what you can do, whether you can file amendments, for instance, in the second reading, or what, what can happen in the second reading. Often national governments, when questioned in national parliaments, don't know the procedures on the European level. They simply don't know. They tell Parliament, well, we will vote in the first reading, but in the second reading we can change it. But when you look at uh, the proposals uh, and the, the procedural rules, you see um, that, they, that there is no opportunity to do so. It's also interesting, we had a long debate uh, in the European Council because of this difference between A items and B items, which was actually about informal rules. These were not formal rules, and uh, we stressed very much the possibilities um, according to the written law and interpretation by, by legal experts. Um, that is, uh, that you can agree on a common position, but you can say, okay, this is not our common position anymore. And council insisted on, once you reach a common position, you have to adopt it. Um, there's no other way, be it in the fishery councils or anywhere, we have to adopt it, and Poland, uh, didn't want to adopt it and so they delayed the process but also the delay was very useful because it um, gave us much more time to to create the movement uh, to stop this uh, legislative act finally stop it uh, so the rules of procedure are, are very important now um, uh, what, what I just want to mention here are, are, are two projects. Um, just have a look at it if you're interested. And there's an, currently an EU broadcast directive prepared, which could be interesting for, for, for podcasting and things like that. I think the Electronic Frontiers Foundation is very concerned about it on the WIPO level, uh, about broadcasting, and they got, uh, I think, 300,000 euro, I think, or like that, uh, for lobbying uh, in this uh, broadcasting uh, area. Um, I don't know much about broadcasting, but um, the Commission proposed 13 September, I think, uh, a similar um, directive. Uh, I just had a look at it. Um, it's interesting because um, at one point uh, it says that commercial, that as a com somehow that as a commercial um, a new service, um, media service, you may not insult someone or, or things like that. Um, and this is very general. I, I can look it up. Um, you may not uh, something against religious beliefs and, and things like that. So we don't have a fort censure in, in Germany. So um, this is a little bit wacky on, on the constitutional level, but I don't know um, um, how it works. Uh, data retention, you know, um, this one through. Um, uh, oh, this is a slash dot article because a comment of our president Peter, which I think is very, is very interesting here. Um, well, this was our press release, and Peter says, um, uh, ironically, a report by the Commission just four years ago on the Echelon surveillance system stated quite clearly that only in a police state uh, is the unrestricted interception of communication permitted by government authorities, and he concluded the EU is now officially a police state by the Commission's own words. Uh, so this went through and uh, this went wrong. Um, now, these other quotes relate to how to contribute inside, par uh, not only inside Parliament, but better before, before it enters Parliament. And there are consultations, there are very interesting consultations. And I really encourage you, when you represent an initiative, if you represent an NGO or even a company or 
just you as a person and have time, draft a paper of 10 pages of, like that, contribute to consultations, because um, show up as a stakeholder who's interested. And there's a page, um, um, Your Voice, it's named Your Voice, with a lot of um, different uh, consultations mentioned. Not all consultations show up on the main page, um, um, but um, on, on this, uh, um, in, this uh, on, of, in the pages of the specific direct, uh, general directorates, um, you find more consultations. And here is, for instance, a call for input on the forthcoming review of the EU regulatory framework for electronic communication and services, including review of the recommendations on relative, relevant markets. So it could well be that you're concerned about it. Or um, there's another very interesting consultation. This is uh, digital libraries of uh, InfoSoc. And this is actually about um, that the EU somehow wants to reinvent the project Gutenberg. Um, and they want to spend 30 millions on, on that, scanning, scanning books and projects and, and like that. And this is a consultation. And interestingly, um, the paper of the, the the working paper and the communication is almost say um, ninety percent on 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 your side somehow um, when when you are in this uh, in this business of um, in this um, in this interest of um, say Projekt Gutenberg or, or things like that so. Um, um, I really encourage you to contribute to this uh, consultation. I think it's very important here um, because um, um, the result of this um, consultation will be that some, sometime, perhaps in one year, perhaps in two years, a directive will get proposed. And when you show up as a stakeholder who says, well, I'm, I represent the Blinds Union and it's important that we get interoperability provisions for the blind and, and things like that, then the likelihood that it will be included before it enters Parliament um, will, be not, uh, will be not low. Um, and other groups will show up. Um, um, I think um, that all official, those lobbyists which are present in, in Brussels, like the BSA or uh, CompTIA and, and so on, all these groups will contribute here and just send uh, three pages or four pages paper. Uh, these papers are often not very good, but you, of course you show that you have interest in it and you, you raise certain issues. So this uh, digital libraries consultation, I think, is, is very, very useful. And actually, this is one presentation, uh, one consultation, where you are able to, to kick the stone somehow and uh, roll it uh, down the other way of the hill. Um, and there are other consultations. Everybody can, can, can contribute here. You just have to know that th this exists here. A consultation on postal services. This might not be really relevant, but sometimes it's useful to, to just have a look. Like uh, there was, were consultations about um, aeroports. Um, you know, perhaps, perhaps there are some relevant questions like how peasants, passenger data shall get tracked or, or things like that. And then you can contribute with your knowledge and say, oh, these solutions don't work and uh, be concerned about these interests and care about privacy or, or whatever. Um, often the commission does not know um, on the one end what the other end is, is doing. So. And you cannot al also you cannot say that the commission is a kind of uniform body. It's, it's a, um, different uh, general directorates, uh, different styles, different people, different way of procedures. Just when you look at the different uh, communication of, of them, uh, they, they all have a different style. So um, it's always useful um, to contribute when you're invited to contribute. Um, another tool which, of course, can be used, oh, I have something else here, which is also interesting, a uh, call for input on the forthcoming review, okay, electronic communications, um, deadline thir 31 of January, and uh, this one here, action for damages, 19th December adopted a green paper and a commission staff working document 
on damages actions for the breach of European Community antitrust rules. So, um, and, and um, the public consultation will last at 21st of April. So perhaps you want to comment on antitrust rules, those who are always so, so concerned about monopolies. Perhaps um, there's something uh, they want to say about it or contribute here. Yeah. Well, uh, one one more thing I'm interested in. Uh, so, I, I hear about the words you say uh, that the influence is quite big, the influence of lobbyisting work uh, when when you look at the decisions. So, uh, I find it a nice idea because it's it's kind of private, organized democracy. Because you and your organization are not there because any state told you or any government mm -hmm. told you to go there. So it, it's just because, I don't know, like uh, I think you and, 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 and the guys who are there uh, are, uh, have, have, have a kind of ideolog ideolog ideology. Yeah, I think of a personal idea to go there. Mm -hmm. um, but is, is the question, is there a danger that, that somebody who has uh, just the money, for, for instance, a company, it, it's quite easy to say, if, if I was the owner of a big company, to say, okay, I will spend this and this amount to send uh, like 20 of, uh, of my workers to Brussels mm -hmm. to make influence, to make uh, the interest, to, to, to make the decision to get nearer to my interests. What do you think? Is, is there a danger? Yeah, well, of course, it happens. Uh, um, everybody tries to defend it, its own interests, and uh, also these groups show up in, in Parliament. But I have to tell you that uh, professional lobbyists are often not very, uh, those traditional lobbyists are often not very efficient um, in, in what they are doing. Uh, that means uh, you, you often overestimate their role. They are just there. I think they, they contribute to the, uh, such consultations. But you, as, as an ordinary citizen with almost no resources, and I think a professional lobbyist gets uh, 500 euro um, a, a day or an hour sometimes. So um, uh, these are real professional people, um, public relations people. But um, you, as an ordinary citizen, can just contribute a paper and uh, outperform them. So though this is interesting. So you don't have to be afraid, really, of, of this. Usually it's, it's a lot of wasted money in, in this whole process. Um, and, well, the software patents debate uh, showed that they wasted millions uh, on, on lobbyists and uh, influencing parliament. Um, but, but your concern, um, I think what, what's really important is transparency, to talk about what they are doing. Uh, in, inside Parliament, to talk about these lobby groups. And in Germany, we had this case with Microsoft's uh, Hunzinger Group. And uh, finally, uh, this, this lobby group became the news. And when it became the news, um, it somehow bro broke, broke down commercially. So um, lobbyists also don't like it when you talk about them and what they are doing and what they are acting and monitor them. And so this is exactly what you shall do. You shall talk about lobbyists. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to, to talk about lobbyists um, in, in the given time now. Um, I, I just want to mention uh, three, three issues. Can I, can, I just, yeah. can I just make a proposal that we meet tomorrow? Hello, can you make the microphone? No, it's uh, yeah. Check, check. OK. Um, regarding the time we have left, prep, we can meet tomorrow at 11 at the workshop area at the end of the hack center or at the last day. There is, I think, there are some free slots for meeting for people who are interested in, in lobbying, not even a European but a German or a regional parliament. That would be perhaps a nice, e nice idea to continue the work and the information exchange. Uh, okay. Um. Uh, you can look up uh, the links. Um, I, I just want to, to enter one small small issue. Um, the Euro Ombudsman. Uh, many people ask us about the European Ombudsman. Generally, you can say in legislative processes, the Ombudsman is irrelevant. 
and it's not really an effective instrument. So when you have a concern about a policy issue, don't go to the ombudsman. You can file peti petitions to the European Parliament. You can write a petition. Um, this is especially good for proactive work. A petition takes about six, uh, six months um, 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 as, as a proactive measures, and then you can uh, get the index of your members of parliament from your nation or from other nations and uh, approach them, approach them in the, in the private, uh, your, your, your local MEP or from a different political party, talk to them. In Germany, we have 99 uh, German MEPs, members of the European Parliament, and you can talk to them, and they are usually very open. You can also invite them to conferences and uh, things like that, establish relations to them. Um, the other links here, uh, down here, um, this is just, just um, these two, because um, they are, I think they are re relevant. Most uh, bad issues that happened in, in the past uh, went through the channel of the EEF, and the EEF is a somehow strange organization. Uh, have a closer look at this organization. It's an association of MEPs inside Parliament, key MEPs inside Parliament, and this group is, is financed by industry contributors. So MEPs can only get, mem uh, get political members. They have 12, a board of 12 members, and uh, every, every MEP who ever get in, got invited to a, to a dinner party uh, gets somehow a member of this group. And they have a lot of events, and here you see uh, Charlie McCreevy was invited to uh, 27, and um, there are business members, and when you look at the business members, uh, these are the business members and associate members. I think also Idri was uh, an associate member, and there are all those relevant people. Um, this is a strange organization. It's an organization built like um, MEP groups, uh, informal MEP groups uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, Transatlantic Policy Network is another organization of a similar style. Uh, I think this organization is somehow kind of outspring of it. Um, kangaroo Group um, on an upper level. And um, uh, interesting is also um, these organizations are just interesting for to monitor what they are doing um, and have a look at it. Perhaps even. Uh, get a member of this organization, and Friends of Europe is also interesting um, as an organization because they have a lot of access to um, to Parliament. Uh, I, I don't have to, no time to talk about uh, the interesting issue of um, of uh, journal lobbying. A good uh, for American um, lobby groups, a good transparency uh, page is SourceWatch. Uh, I really can recommend it. Like, uh, just have, as an example, just have a look at uh, the page about Tech Central Station, and then they tell you that Tech Central Station is part of the DCI group and, and things like that. Uh, and the other interesting issue is that the Commission itself starts currently um, under Commissioner Kallas, I think he's the Greek Commissioner, um, starts a transparency initiative. So registration for, for, for lobbyists or things like that, more monitoring, more um, transparency that they lay open their accounts and, and things like that. Um, so um, I, I just stop here. Perhaps we, perhaps we can meet tomorrow again or um, outside the conference and um, exchange other views. And uh, tomorrow there will be another talk in the morning um, of me uh, with Tonnerre or of Tonnerre with me better. <laughs> and and um, we will talk about, about software patents and the next the next steps in the debate. Um, I, I'm sorry it was a little bit uh, much content and um, well um, have a look at this link list. Um, I think it's useful as a short introduction. So I say good night. <laughs>